All right, if you'll, All right, if you'll find your place in the, in the book of Acts and chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, as you're turning there, just a brief word of announcement. Uh, we will keep you posted as things change or don't change about what we're doing here, but you will know we'll be preaching some way, somehow, uh, but we'll uh, work those things out as time progresses. Uh, we encourage you to do the best you can to keep yourself healthy. Uh, try to follow the rules that are laid out for you. But at the same time, we will figure out ways to have church and how to do that. The Lord has blessed us with a beautiful day, and we are thankful for that. Uh, next Sunday could be a monsoon, so we just have to work with whatever the Lord gives us. Uh, but we'll let you know as things unfold. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. This is the gospel according to Peter. Now, just to give you the introduction of what is going on in Acts chapter 10, and then we'll look at the text. Peter is gone to Caesarea to meet with a man by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius had been praying, and he was expecting Peter to come. So because he knew Peter was coming, he gathered his relatives, he gathered his friends together in his home. And when Peter arrived, he asked, Peter asked Cornelius, why did you send for me? And Cornelius had been praying, and the answer to his prayer was that he needed to send for Peter to come. Now, everyone was gathered, Peter was present, and the text says in verse 33 that they were in the presence of God. Cornelius then said, We are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded of the Lord. Now, today, granted, it's not the exact same situation, but it is similar. Much prayer has been offered for this community and even for this city. God has answered our prayers by shutting everything down. Most all normal activities have come to an end, so no little kids are running around chasing a little soccer ball around the pasture. Nobody's gathering to watch football and basketball today, and nobody's running to the park to do all of these things, and so God shut everything down. And so we've gathered here in this parking lot, and God's caused us to do so, and this, all of this has changed our life to some degree. And people have questions. People have concerns. People have fears. People have anxieties. And for some, the future looks a little bit uncertain. But we have gathered today in this parking lot in the presence of God. We are not in a church building, but we have gathered here for the purpose of worshiping. And I would just say to you, we have no entertainment. I don't even know how to do a drama, so we certainly don't have one. We don't even have lights. We have no air conditioning. We have no padded pews. We have no celebrities, and I doubt anybody wants my autograph. And we have no religious traditions this morning because we've never done it this way. Today we meet in the presence of God simply to humble ourselves and to hear all that God has to say to us through His Word in Acts 10, 34 through 43. So the text reads this way. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Or another translation would read, God shows no favoritism. But in every nation... Anyone who fears Him and does what is right is acceptable to Him. And for the word that He sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. 
And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in this country, of the Jews, and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. There is a much greater pandemic that is going on globally in this world today than COVID-19. All of the things that are being said and done about COVID-19, I suppose, are right and in their place. But it is a minority in comparison with the great epidemic that is in our world. It is this epidemic called sin. And people are infected with sin and they have totally depraved hearts. And the wages of sin is death. And people who die in their sin will spend an eternity in hell. And millions of people globally are dying in sin and waking up in a Christless eternity under the wrath of God in hell. That issue is far more severe than COVID-19. But I will let you know this from my text. The great news about this epidemic of sin is, is that there is a cure. There is a gospel of good news that provides peace between God and man. We'll lay this text out just step by step. Number one is this. Number one, God shows no favoritism. God shows no partiality. In the book of Romans, in chapter, one, chapter 2 in the book of Romans, he lays out a case very clearly that men are in sin and that judgment is going to come upon all men. He talks about hypocrisy. talks about people saying one thing and doing another and all this fake religion, if you will. He lays that out very beautifully in Romans 2. And when you get down to Romans 2 and verse 11, he makes this same statement. God shows no partiality. God deals with every individual on the same basis. God deals with people in perfect accordance with His holy law. Everyone who breaks the law of God is guilty before God. Those who break the Sabbath, those who commit idolatry, those who lie, those who steal, those who covet, those who commit adultery, those who dishonor their father or their mother, those who break those commandments, those who come up false in those commandments are guilty before God. Romans 3 says, there is none that is good, no, not one. All have fallen short. All have come short of the glory of God. There is no partiality with God upon this matter. So I would say to you today, God is a God of equality. God is a God of equality. Equality in sinfulness. Number one, in the economic level, there is no favoritism from God toward the rich. There's no favoritism. You don't get a pass because you got money. You don't get a pass because you're the head of a corporation. God doesn't show favoritism to rich people, nor does he show disdain for those who are financially poor. In God's economy, they are regarded the same with no favoritism. Secondly, educational level. There is no favoritism to the man or the woman here today who holds a degree. Just because you went to the university and you graduated and you got a diploma up on your wall, you get no benefits from God that He treats you in a different or special way. God shows no favoritism to the degree holder and no disdain for the common folk like you and me. 
Thirdly, what about the effort level? There is no favoritism by God for those who try really hard. Those who put their best foot forward and exert all their religious energy to do good, you get no favoritism from God. And there is no disdain for those who have not given any effort in the things of God. And we also say, fourthly, the ethnic location of your life. There is no favoritism to the black transgender person and no disdain for the middle class white American. Why? Because God does not show favoritism even on an ethnic class. God is not partial to one group no more than he is to the other group. In God's economy, there's this equality that all are regarded before him as sinful in breaking his law. They're all guilty before God because he is absolutely and perfectly righteous. All have sinned. None is righteous. No, not one. Be reminded, you may not see this as good news, but it's the best news you're going to hear all day. Everybody in this parking lot and across this world was conceived in iniquity, was born in sinfulness, and we have a totally depraved heart. It means that in our heart is this world of iniquity. It means that out of our mouth comes these things that are in our heart. Our big issue today is a sin issue. That's the issue that must be solved. And the Bible teaches that we are born dead in our trespasses and sins. This is a global epidemic. Everybody on the face of the globe has this depraved heart, and if they continue with this depraved heart, they're going to die a physical death, and they're going to wake up in the spiritual reality of hell. This is alarming news. We claim we believe this stuff, but do we believe it? That our hearts are totally depraved. If God does not do something with our heart, then we're going to end up in an eternal hell. And so total depravity has affected each and every one of us. In the light of God's law, every single person is guilty before God. Even the cyclists riding down the road have a depraved heart just like the rest of us. And unless they repent and believe in Christ, they have no hope of eternity. But my text also says this, that God sent the word of good news You'll see that in verse 36, that God sent the word of good news, preaching good news. And so we ask the question, you, you just told me I had a depraved heart. You just told me I was wicked. You just told me I was guilty. You told me if something wasn't done with my heart, I'm going to end up in hell. I don't see how this is good news. Well, the good news is, is there's a cure. The good news is there's something that can be done about the sinful condition of your heart. The good news is, is that there is peace between God and man through the person, Jesus Christ. That's the good news. We know from the Bible that God is angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 7, verse 11. We know that man is at enmity with God. James 4, 4. Think about it. God is angry with the wicked. Humanity is wicked. Man is at enmity with God. Another word for enmity is hatred. So you have a God who's angry, and you have a man on the other side who is at hatred towards God. It's like trying to put the opposite ends of a magnet together. They just won't go together. There's this opposition or this division. And the good news that we find in the text here is that peace can be established through a mediator. Now, there's only one mediator between God and man, and that mediator is Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can mediate between the two parties. And with Christ as our mediator, the God who is angry is the God who becomes merciful, and the man who is hating towards God becomes a lover of God because Christ is in the middle as a substitute who pays for our sin and absorbs God's wrath upon our behalf in order that we can be forgiven and set free for eternity. 
And the good news is that the preeminence is in the person Jesus Christ. It, it really doesn't matter in so many regards what the government says. And frankly, I don't even care what they say. Why, why would I say such a statement? Because my text assures me of something. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He's Lord over the President of the United States. He's Lord over the whole world. You know, like you could take a water brook and just move it however you want. My God can do that with the hearts of kings. He is Lord and sovereign over everything. Jesus Christ is the preeminent Lord. And He is the one that we all must bow to. You remember Philippians chapter 2? Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? The whole globe at some point will have to come to a position upon judgment day to bow and confess that yes, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Now, as long as we have time, instead of waiting for judgment day, then we ought to be able to say today, you know what? I'm not waiting on judgment day. I know that I have sin in my heart. I know I need to repent. I know I need to believe in Christ and confess Him as Lord today. Now, this peace that comes through Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you, I can make a longer list, but I'll just give you two. What was the purpose of God sending the Lord Jesus Christ? Number one, the purpose of the Lord Jesus coming was to redeem a people for the glory of God. Think about it. This is such an interesting subject, is it not? Let me tell you how interesting it is. All of the angels in heaven stooped to look down to try to figure out how God can take people as wicked as us and make them reconciled and friends with himself. Like, how in the world could you do this? And he sends forth his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be a substitute for sinners. And the angels are looking and they're going, are you kidding me? The Son of God is going to die on a tree and bear the sins of wicked people and absorb the wrath of the Father and He's going to be raised on the third day that these people can be forgiven and dwell eternally in heaven. And God says, that's exactly what I'm doing. That's why I've sent my Son. For I so love the world that I gave my only Son that whoever would believe in Him could have everlasting life. 1 John says also the purpose of Jesus coming was to take away sins. 1 John 3, 5. So the good news is that Jesus Christ has come as a substitute for sinners. And for everyone who would believe, you could be forgiven. Thirdly in my text, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Anointed, set apart, unique, one and only. Several times he uses this word in regards to Christ. Acts 4.27 They were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed. Or in Luke 4.18 Jesus says it of himself. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. So Jesus even testifies himself. He anointed and set me apart to proclaim good news to the world. And the good news is, is that your sin issue is resolved in Christ. And then also in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 9, he says, you've loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you. And so Jesus Christ is set apart. Listen to me this morning. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. Isaiah says, Look unto me and be ye saved, all you the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. There's a, there's a universal call that's worldwide for all nations. And then there's a very particular and limited view. It must be to Christ and Christ alone that you look. Look, the Republican Party can't save you. 
A nation can't save you. The cure for COVID-19 can't save you. Money can't save you. The government could print another trillion dollars this week. It's not going to help your soul. All of these philosophies and worldly approaches to solving the human problem, they all fall miserably short. The only way you can have hope is to cast yourself upon Christ because everybody here is going to die. The death rate is one per person. I don't care what the statistics are. I haven't watched the news. I don't know any numbers. I'll give you a news flash. Everybody in this parking lot, including this preacher, is going to die. There's no way out. Every one of us, our life is going to come to an end. And the only cure you have in order to have life and have it to the abundance is to cast yourself solely upon Christ. That in the next life, you will live eternally in His presence. And apart from that, you have no hope. So church, be encouraged. If you're in Christ, you have everything. You have the only one that you need. God affirmed Jesus as the one by his miraculous work. It says he came with the Holy Spirit and with power. You've never met a man like Christ. Who, who do you know that walks up to blind people and gives them sight? Who do you know that walks on water? Who do you know that raises the dead? Who do you know that gives hearing to the deaf? Who do you know that walks up to the pool of Bethesda where a man's been laying for 38 years and he looks at him and says, won't you just take your mat and go home? The guy gets his mat and walks home. Who does this? Who is it that can preach in such a way that when the whole world is sent out to arrest him, they can't arrest him because no one ever spoke like he spoke? He says, nobody is like Christ. He is this miraculous, powerful one that has been anointed and set apart by God. He manifested who God is by doing good and by healing everywhere that he went. And he also magnified righteousness. God was with him and God was revealed through him. If you're keeping up, point number five, verse 39. I said to you that God is not partial. I said to you that the good news is preached, that there can be peace in Christ. I preached that God has anointed and set Christ apart. And now we come to this point. Jesus was put to death. You'll find that in verse 39. Now, why was Jesus put to death? Somebody's got to pay the debt. Somebody's got to pay. You see, because the wages of sin is death, somebody's got to die. The penalty for sin is this death penalty. There's no escaping of it. If somebody does not pay your debt for you, then you have to pay the debt yourself. That's the way it works. So, Christ is not some figurative, made-up, mystical story. A real flesh, a real body, really born of a virgin, really walking around the earth, really living a sinless life. In Him there was no sin. He didn't sin in word, in thought, or in deed. And this Christ is fulfilling the law perfectly. You remember all those laws we broke? Idolatry, breaking the Sabbath, dishonoring our parents, lying, murdering, all those laws we broke? Christ didn't break any of those. None of those. He didn't break one law. None of them. Can you imagine a man who did not ever commit sin? A perfect life. We had to have a perfect substitute. Sin had to be paid for. It wasn't swept under a rug, overlooked, but a real person took the penalty of sin upon himself and he died a real death on a real cross where real blood flowed out, real water ran out, where his head really bowed down and he really gave up the ghost and his body really died. It was a bodily death. They took a body down off the cross. They wrapped a body. They anointed a body and they put a body in a tomb because Christ died a bodily death in the place of sinners. Christ our Savior lived perfectly and took... Can you... Man, please understand. Christ took your lying tongue, your adulterous heart, your covetous heart. He took those sins that you've committed and He put them upon Himself and He bore the wrath of His Father and absorbed all of that wrath paying for your sin. 
If you fully understood that, surely it would make you break out in some form of compassion and say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for paying my debt for me. I owed a debt I could not pay, and you paid on my behalf. Oh, glory be to King Jesus for coming and saving my wicked soul. What a great Savior. The idea that he would save somebody like me, I, I've been preaching for 30 years. I still can't get over this reality that Christ would save someone as wicked as I am. What a Savior that He would pay what I ought to pay. The, the punishment I deserved He took. Are you kidding me? This is a mystery above all mysteries that Christ would do this upon our behalf. In verse 40, vindication. Was His death satisfactory? Did He accomplish what He set forth to do? Well, God raised him from the dead. This is vindication. I've received the sacrifice. Hope, this today, hope abounds. You talk to your friends and stuff around. They're afraid of death. They're afraid of the virus. They're afraid of getting sick. All these realities are running around on our planet. People are washing their hands. Finally, Monk has become famous. If you don't know Monk, see me later. But Monk has become famous because everybody's washing their hands. Everybody's trying to be clean. And all of this type of thing. But I want to tell you, church, this morning, hope abounds. There is life in Christ. You know the text. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Most of those people work at the abortion clinic. But they come. the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Christ has come to give life. And not, not just life, but life to the abundance. Hey, look, right now, I'm in the same planet everybody else is in, and I have life to the absolute full. Why? Because that's what Christ promised. I have hope today. At the end of this service, if I fall over dead, I haven't lost a thing. I've gained it all because in Christ I'm an heir to all things. What hope abounds in Him? It is only the rejecters of Christ who will go to hell. Those who receive Christ aren't going to hell. Look, the reality of this resurrection, if you can... Uh, pages are blown, but if you can, just turn quickly over to 1 Corinthians. Just real quickly. I don't know if you're in a hurry. You can't get out of the parking lot anyway. 1 Corinthians 15. Just hear it read again, 1 Corinthians 15. Just to be assured of this. 1 Corinthians 15 and beginning in verse 1. Paul says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. Amen. The gospel that I preach to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Let me offer a comment there. There is a spurious belief. There is a false belief, a religious belief. I think it's an epidemic in Azel. Everybody confesses Jesus, but their life just don't look like it. That type of faith. A real faith actually changes your life because the power of the gospel sets you free from sin. In verse 3, this is his gospel in a nutshell. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then what's the word appeared? And he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are alive, some have fallen asleep. Verse 7, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. All of these words for appear come from a Greek word, harao, which means to see objectively with comprehension. It's not a ghost. It's not a figment. It's not a mystery. 
These are real men and women just like us. They saw a real person with real flesh and form and body to the degree that they sat down and ate with him and they drank with him. They had conversation with him. 500 people at one time can physically see him standing there. It is an undisputable reality of Scripture that the Son of God who was crucified on Calvary, who was buried in a tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, buried him there and sealed the tomb it is an undisputable reality of the truth of Scripture that that Jesus was resurrected and seen and, and had conversation with. It was the reality of the day to this degree that those who experienced the resurrection were willing to give their lives to preach the gospel even if it meant their own martyrdom. These guys that were running in fear and hiding are now standing up and say, are we to obey God or men? We'll obey God. And they preach. Why did they have so much boldness and confidence? Because the tomb is empty and Christ is alive. And the same is true for us today. We're going to run and hide somewhere because there's a COVID-19. No more than anything else is going to make us run and hide. Where am I going to go? Let us stand for the truth and proclaim Christ because He truly was ready resurrected from the dead. And then verse 42, contrary to the religious nuts of this day who only can see God in the view of God is love, which I totally agree with because 1 John says God is love. I totally agree with that. But also agree with the reality that Scripture says that Jesus Christ is going to judge us. And he says this very clearly in verse 42 that he will be the judge of the living and the dead. When the Lord Jesus returns, the world will be over. And when he returns, all those who are alive will have to face him on judgment day. All of those who have died will be resurrected out of their tombs, and they will have to stand before his judgment. And his judgment will be based on his own righteousness, on the clarity and the truth of scriptures, and we will be found innocent or guilty as he judges us. And the only ones who will be found righteous are those who are in Christ. That's the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel is not simply that Christ paid for your sins. That's glorious. But that's only half of the truth. Listen to me. You say, let me say this example. Let's say you're a million dollars in debt and you don't have one penny. Just imagine, you're a million dollars in debt, and you don't have one penny. They've locked you up, and you can't get out unless your million-dollar fine is paid. And I come in, being a good-natured guy, and I pay your debt. I pay a million dollars. You're like, wow, that's great. Is it? Because you're still broke. You hear? Your fine is paid, but you still can't buy a cup of coffee or donut. You got no money. So it's one thing to have your sin forgiven, but if that's all there is, you're still left at zero. That's why the gospel is so much more that Christ does. Not only does he forgive all of our sins, but he gives us his righteousness. Does anybody hear this? The Son of God who is absolutely perfect in righteousness clothes us with righteousness if we believe in Him. Then, on judgment day, we walk in before God and we enter into the joy of the Lord. You say, you mean you just walk in? Well, certainly. I'm home. You know, my parents live in East Texas. They're sitting in a parking lot and watching this thing live right now in a parking lot in East Texas. I can tell you right now, if I decide to jump in the car and go home this afternoon and I go up to the house, I'm not even going to knock on the door. I'm just going to open the door and walk in. You're just going to walk in the house. It's my house. It's my parents. It's where they live. I don't have to ask for permission. When I get to the gates of heaven, I'm just going to walk in the gate. Right? Because why? Because I've been adopted. I'm an heir to all things in Christ. I'm going to walk into home because I have a Father who has established a place for me that He has built that human hands can't duplicate. And then lastly is verse 43. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 43, hear the word of the Lord. To him, 
That's the Lord Jesus. All the prophets, there's you a historical theological note. If you didn't know what the prophets were doing in the Old Testament, they were preaching Christ. If you want to know how Abraham was saved, he believed Christ. He was regenerated and then had faith in Christ just like we do because there's only one gospel. So to him, Jesus Christ, all the prophets bore witness. And here's your great news that you can take home with you today. That everyone who believes in him receives. Do you you see the text? I want you to see that the text does not say everyone who believes in him might receive. Everyone who believes in him possibly will receive. Everyone who believes in him has a chance. Look, this is a promise of God that for every man, every woman, every person who would believe in Christ, they will receive. What? What are we going to receive? Do you remember the beginning of the sermon? Your problem is not COVID-19. Your problem is a totally depraved heart. It's sin. If you believe in Christ, you will receive something. What? Forgiveness. You'll receive forgiveness in Him. Forgiveness from what? From all my sins. How is that possible? Through His name alone. Through the Christ who substituted for me and paid for my debt. Because of what He has done, I can be forgiven, adopted into His family, and have eternal life in heaven. Praise be unto Him. In conclusion... Every believer receives forgiveness of sins. Every believer has peace with God. You remember God angry with the wicked? Man at enmity with God. But in Christ, harmony, fellowship, unity. All of these things are accomplished by the gospel. Every believer will love God and hate sin. Will not be able to continue practicing sin any longer because the Lord will set them free from these things. I would say to you that God has been kind to you this day. God's word has shown you that God does not play favorites with anyone. He has told you everything you need for this life and the life to come is to be found in Christ Jesus by faith. I hope you will consider the word of God. Contemplate your own life and your need to be right with God when your life comes to an end. And I would say to our church, It is the responsibility and the privilege of the church during a time like this to be calm. To be calm. Amen? Amen. Do we believe this book? Then we should be calm. We should be resolved. And we should be confident in what we believe. Yeah, back in the Reformation, I'm, I took a sidetrack, but back in the Reformation, there's a man by the name of John Calvin, and an epidemic broke out, and people were dying, and they quarantined everybody, and they quarantined him in his room, and if he came out of his room, he's going to be arrested. You know what he did? At night, when everybody went to sleep, he snuck out of his window, climbed out, and went to the worst district where the disease was the worst, and stood there and preached the gospel. Then he'd go back and climb in his window before he got caught. Why? Because he was resolved that people need the gospel more than they need anything else. So church, we are to minister the gospel to those around us in a time like this. People seem to be a little bit more open to the conversation. Give them a gospel track. Ask them if you can pray for them. Do something real to meet a need in their life. Help them in some way to show them the love of Christ. And lastly, I remind you of this. God is on His throne. And He's controlling all things and will accomplish all His purposes. I don't mean to lose you here. My church knows this. If you're visiting, maybe you don't know this. But look, the virus didn't come from the world. It didn't come from the this or that. God sends viruses. God sends plagues. God sends droughts. God sends pestilence. And God does so because people have wicked hearts. And he has to do something to wake them up that they might repent. So God has sent these things. It's the church's responsibility to respond rightly in the midst of them. There's no reason for fear, no reason for anxiety, no reason for confusion, uncertainty about the future. Hello, I know what the future holds, right? 
I mean, we're going to die, and then we're going to go into the presence of God for all of eternity. You don't have to be confused about the future anymore. Everybody dies. Those in Christ get to go home. One day Christ will appear, and the world will end as we now know it. And those who are in Christ will be joyfully brought into his presence. And those who are outside of Christ will suffer eternal judgment. And God has given us graciously this day to make sure that we are right with him. Let me close in a word of prayer and just hang on. Let me give you directions before you try to depart the parking lot. Father in heaven, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the gospel, the reminder of it. I thank you for Christ, whom you have given for the epidemic of sin. I thank you for his perfect righteousness. Thank you for his substitution. Thank you for his resurrection. I thank you for the hope of his near return. I pray today that each one of us would focus more upon Christ than upon all the things around us. For those who are outside of him, I pray they would repent of their sins and believe Christ. Truly and genuinely, they would cast themselves upon Jesus. I pray that your church would be stronger, her faith would be increased, and much fruit would be born for your great name. I pray these things today by your spirit, in Christ's name, amen.